Welcome all. Um, this is the fourth talk of the online series called Inferentialism on Natural Naturalized Grounds. Um, the series accompanies a special issue of philosophical topics that is about to be published in uh, the spring. And today it is my pleasure to welcome here Professor Hans-Jan Glock from the University of Zurich. As you all might know, Professor Glock is um, well known for his work in philosophy of mind and philosophy of language with a special interest in animal cognition and normativity of language. And today's talk, based on his paper, will be on the latter one, on normativity of content language. Professor Glock starts whenever you are ready. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's you know, very nice to be engaging with the Kratic uh, Kralovi uh, group again. And uh, it was a pleasure to contribute to this special issue. Um, I have to um, plead for your understanding. Uh, you know, uh, this is the, the heat of the kitchen as far as our teaching, etc., is concerned. And so I haven't prepared um, a very substantive uh, presentation. Um, so I do hope that um, you will have read the text. Um, uh, but just to make sure that, you know, I, I'm giving you the essentials of, of what I wanted uh, to uh, say in, in the paper. I just go through the abstract right at the start. I will dwell on some of these issues uh, a bit more, but you know, not uh, at inordinate length. So, you know, uh, my uh, uh, aim was to address two areas of potential conflict uh, between inferentialism on the one hand and naturalism on the other, namely uh, normativity and rationality. Uh, and you know, the main bulk of the paper is concerned with these two issues. So as regards normativity, you know, I'm obviously on the inferentialist side in thinking that meaning is a matter of uh, uh, rules for the use of words. Um, but uh, I hope to develop a position which is less vulnerable to naturalistic uh, objections. Um, you know, I guess the my main selling point is the idea that once we recognize a minimal notion of normativity and um, how it develops into more refined types of normativity, there's nothing semantically uh, or ontologically mysterious about normativity. Um, and uh, statements of norms, in my view, are perfectly and innocuously truth act. Uh, then, you know, uh, as regards to rationality, you know, I, my, I, my sympathies are more on the naturalistic side. Um, uh, I do think that uh, there is a danger in inferentialism to over-intellectualize the normative practices which underlie meaning and intentional content. Um, and finally, you know, if there's a naturalism that I can subscribe to, it's uh, an anthropological naturalism um, of the kind that I associate most closely with, with Peter Strawson. I, I haven't had time to, you know, um, prepare slides for that, but I'm very happy to talk about it um, in the sequel. Okay, so here is the... Uh, Preview, uh, as I already indicated, uh, section number five, you know, I haven't been able to, to draft. So first I'm going to talk uh, just by way of motivation about meaning, use and inferentialism. And then I'll talk about inferentialism and naturalism. I'll make sure that I've said something really outrageous about Hegelianism so that you can all lay your teeth into it. Then I will um, uh, talk about the two uh, aforementioned areas of conflict, normativism and rationalism. And then, you know, I guess I'll just uh, give a, um, um, an oral homily on the virtues of anthropological naturalism. Okay, so now my starting point, I mean, the way I come by uh, uh, an interest in inferentialism is through a youth theory of meaning, right? I mean, I don't come from uh, the 
the Pittsburgh camp, I, I'm very much, uh, you know, um, a Cambridge person. Um, so, you know, I come from Wittgenstein. So a uh, use theory has uh, the attraction of avoiding the category mistake involved in a Fido Fido theory, which equates the meaning of an expression with an object it stands for, right? The objects have a weight. Um, they have a location, space, and time. They can move at a certain velocity, but meanings can't. Um, there is also a more uh, plausible uh, con you know, referential conception of, uh, of meaning, which identifies the meaning of an expression not with its referent, but with the referential relation to such a, you know, to such a referent. Um, and the, the, the distinction is often lost, but I think it's important. But I think even this more uh, plausible referential conception of meaning uh, faces uh, the objection that for many, uh, uh, you know, perfectly meaningful uh, types of expressions, there is no bona fide type of object uh, with which they could stand in a referential relation. Um, now, of course, Frigians would disagree, but, you know, um, oh, sorry, I, I should, I should, uh, you must complain, uh, uh, what's the view, oops, 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 uh, I, I need to get to the, um, uh, you, okay, can you still see my, my, my slides? Good. Okay. So, oh, now it's now, now we're talking. Okay. Now, you know, there's not just uh, a negative uh, premium on a use theory. There's also a positive premium. I think, you know, many uh, indisputable truisms count in favor of a use theory of meaning. Whether an expression means something in a given language de depends on whether it has an established use in the relevant linguistic community. What the expression means depends on how it can be used within that community. And we learn what an expression means by learning how to use it, just as we learn how to play chess, and not by associating the pieces with certain objects, but by learning how they can be moved. And I think this is the, uh, the crux of Wittgenstein's, um, you know, still underexplored chess analogy. So what it distinguishes a chess piece from a mere piece of wood is not its association with an abstract entity or with a mental process, but its rule-guided use. Okay, now, uh, you know, those are the attractions of use theory, but, you know, it also has always faced an objection, namely the term use in vacuo is just too uh, general and nebulous, um, and more specifically, not all features of the use of an expression are relevant to its meaning. I mean, you know, I here am, uh, if you wish, orthodox in that I think there is a difference between uh, those aspects of linguistic use which are of merely syntactical or merely pragmatic um, relevance and those aspects which are genuinely semantic. Now, conceptual role semantics is an attempt to solve this problem. Um, Unlike, for instance, Wittgenstein or Ryle, it sets out to identify in a controlled and systematic fashion those features of the use of an expression that determine its linguistic meaning. And that's supposed to be its role or function within a linguistic system, in particular, its role in classification and in inference. Um, now, inferentialism uh, is a particular version of conceptual role semantics, and I take it that it stands out by dint of two ideas. The first is normativism, right? Uh, uh, the meaning constitutive roles uh, of expressions are governed by rules. Um, and uh, uh, the second uh, point is that uh, inferentialism emphasizes rules governing intralinguistic moves. I mean, inferences, you know, movements from one proposition to another, um, in, you know, from premises to conclusions. Although, you know, um, uh, 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 they are in Peregrine and Sellers, they are, you know, there's it, it, a slightly uh, wider 
scope. Uh, uh, now, uh, Brandon's version that, of inferentialism that has become emblematic uh, has two further distinguishing features, um, namely inferential relations are, I guess, analyzed in terms of commitments and entitlements, they are relations that preserve commitments and entitlements, and this construal, uh, this analysis of, of inference is embedded in a picture of human communities that emphasizes their intellectual sides. I mean, the, the fact that it, human communities are structured normatively, uh, but in particular, they are structured by a highly intellectual kind of language game, um, the giving and asking for reasons. Well, I, well I mean, you, you don't have a chance to dispute this. So now inferentialism, uh, and naturalism, which is, of course, uh, the interest of, of this series, as well as of the special issue in philosophical topics. Now, inferentialism is usually treated as a purely philosophical doctrine, as some people, not me, would use the, the A word and talk about armchair here. Um, but I, I think, you know, quite rightly, um, inferentialism does not itself seek to explain the causal origins of meaning or linguistic uh, communication or of norms. Um, it is rather concerned with a constitutive question, namely what constitutes uh, an expression being meaningful? You know, uh, what is it that qualifies as a sound or inscription uh, uh, as meaningful? Um, uh, that's one uh, uh, respect in which it is, uh, if you wish, aloof from from a natural science, and it's a respect that I, it's a respect that I respect. Um, the other point is is perhaps more contentious. Um, inferentialism uh, talks a lot about allegedly unique human capacities, rationality, normativity, language, etc. But you know, it has paid until recently. Um, very little heed to what empirical sciences tell us about human beings, right? And that's obviously, at the very least, a lacuna. It may be a weakness, but it's a, at the very least a lacuna. Of course, um, it's a lacuna that exactly, you know, is addressed by the organizers of this series and by uh, and the editors of the volume. Now, you know, so there's a certain aloofness, a certain distance between inferentialism and um, natural science, and if you wish, the philosophical arm of natural science, namely naturalism. But I think there are also more specific conflicts between inferentialism and philosophical naturalism on the other. And, and you know, I think those I, I obviously will dwell on um, uh, uh, later. But, you know, I think it's important to note that um, it's not just that, you know, there's, there are these two, I don't know what, paradigms or projects and they haven't been properly related. It's that there are, um, there is the, the specter of a real conflict here. Okay, now when we talk about naturalism, of course, there are more types of naturalisms than naturalists. Um, so, you know, we need to specify what we're talking about. Um, so I just follow, I mean, it's my, it's my own uh, terminological coinage, but the distinction is hardly original. Um, Metaphilosophical naturalism simply claims that philosophy is a branch of or continuous with natural science. Epistemological naturalism is nothing other than what used to be called scientism. There simply is no genuine knowledge outside uh, uh, of natural science. No science, the natural science provides us with all the knowledge there is. Everything else is hot air or poetry or what have you. Um, and finally, ontological naturalism um, denies that there is any reality or any uh, existing realm other than the natural world of, well, you know, depending on your favorite um, uh, scientific world, your world of matter, energy, spatial temporal objects or events, I mean strings, if, if have, have strings if you must. So those are the versions of naturalism. Um, what's also important is that uh, naturalism can take at least two different forms. There's reductionism and eliminativism. 
Now, you know, there are many um, phenomena which prima facie seem to defy, you know, uh, either some or all of these types of naturalisms. And in view of those apparently non-natural phenomena, NN, um, uh, a naturalist can react in either of two ways. Um, uh, she can insist uh, that an N can be reduced to natural facts after all, or to natural phenomena after all. So, you know, uh, examples are utilitarianism, evolutionary epistemology, evolutionary aesthetics, or teleological semantics. So, a, a reductionism in the name of, of naturalism is the project of naturalizing a certain phenomenon. Um, and the spirit of uh, reductionism was uh, aptly summarized uh, by Fodor. So, you know, an N, value, meaning, uh, logical relations. This, this, this is real, but it's real only because it's really something else. You know, it's part of the natural order, which somehow or other can be accommodated by natural science. Or the alternative is eliminativism or nihilism, um, and N is spurious. Um, prime example is uh, Mackey's um, error theory about morality. Um, another example is eliminativism um, about the mental. And the final example is semantic anti-normativism, uh, e.g. of the Stockholm kind, which says, well, look, uh, you know, uh, meaning, uh, meaning is real, but the normativity of meaning is, is spurious. Okay. Now, uh, there are clear affinities between inferentialism and ontological naturalism. Yeah? So, uh, at least prima facie, there's no reason why inferentialism should uh, stand in tension with ontological naturalism, because in rejecting referential or representational approaches to meaning, it also uh, repudiates uh, two supernaturalist positions. An expression has the meaning uh, not because it stands for an abstract entity beyond space and time, you know, that would be the Platonist option, uh, nor because it is associated with a, a mental process, um, an inner process that is at least beyond space, if not beyond time, um, a mental process accompanying its use, partial Cartesianism uh, or, or mentalism. So, like use theories in general, um, inferentialism pursues a line which one uh, uh, should call pragmatist in a loose sense. Um, it explains uh, meaning and intentionality by reference to features of human practice. And human practice um, is a relatively unmysterious phenomenon if you compare it to all the other things that have exercised philosophers like God or, you know, uh, ideals or essences or res um, cogitans. So in principle, you know, uh, naturalism and inferentialism should go along just like a house on fire, but um, there are two slight complications, or not so slight complications. One is a Seller's uh, Kantian dichotomy between the space of reasons and the realm of causal law, um, uh, which um, section seven refers to a section in the paper, not, not the presentation. Um, I do think that this dichotomy, um, at the very least, needs to be um, um, modified, it, it needs to be mitigated. Um, and the other uh, complication is that, you know, from the very same Pittsburgh school, which gave us um, uh, inferentialism, um, there hails um, the ambition to move from a Kantian phase of the Pittsburgh school to a novel Hegelian phase. Yeah, so uh, both Brandon and McDowell um, are the protagonists of this. Um, and in Brandom's case, at least, this alleged upgrade um, includes resounding sympathies for Hegelian idealism. Um, I have no idea. As far as I know, Brandom's uh, uh, book on um, 
äh, erinnerter, wieder erinnerter äh, Idealismus has not yet appeared in, in, in English, but you know, there is material um, that's available. And this is where I think um, there is a real incompatibility between uh, naturalism and, I mean, there's a clear incompatibility between naturalism and inferentialism insofar as the latter is uh, wedded to a Hegelian idealism. So here is my, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, 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 brief and dirty, quick and dirty account of Hegel's metaphysical system. So Hegel's metaphysical system is spinocist metaphysics, um, uh, but uh, no, it's a Spinozist and historicized reworking of Trinitarian theology. Yeah? You've got, uh, got the Father, the Spirit, there's the Son, which is the um, you know, manifestation of spirit in nature, and then there's the Holy Ghost, which is the philosophical reflection on that manifestation. So reality is nothing but a manifestation of a spiritual principle, which transcends individual minds, um, absolute spirit. And absolute spirit, or the absolute, was previously known as God. Um, now, uh, nature in general, and human history in particular, are the arenas in which uh, spirit pursues its inherent telos of attaining self-knowledge. Um, the process by which it does so is uh, the process of Hegelian direct, uh, dialectic. It's a goal-directed and rational process. There's a rational principle at work here. And through the unfolding of this rational principle in history, uh, spirit overcomes the distortions and gaps uh, that mar its uh, initial manifestations. Now, it is a form of idealism. It's not a form of a Barclian or Kantian transcendental idealism, it's a kind of theistic idealism, reality as it is in itself is entirely mental. It, it's a manifestation of intellect, so it can be fully grasped by the mind. And by, for the same reason, philosophy can attain insights into ultimate reality um, and ground or even encompass all other disciplines. So Hegel really is a kickback to pre-Kantian rationalism. All genuine knowledge is a priori. Even apparently contingent facts like the number of planets can be derived through the method of dialectic the, uh, and speculation, as, as Hegel calls it. Okay, now, you know, both uh, this methodology, rationalist, speculative methodology, and the teleological conception of the world are entirely alien to contemporary science. Insofar as Hegelian idealism is a speculative tale about an atemporal logical progeny of concepts, you know, the, the thoughts of God before creation, it is obscure, arguably incoherent, and in my view, incompatible with the formal sciences. And insofar as it is for a philosophy of nature, a naturphilosophie, a theory of the actual development of the natural order in, in, in space and time, it is at best intelligent design theory avant la lettre. Um, so, you know, it's just beyond the pale. So, you know, Brandon may be right that idealism should be remembered, wieder erinnert, as it says in the title of his book. But the verdict on any attempt to reconcile echt Hegelian speculation and teleology with the methods and insights of modern science can only be forget it. Yeah, it's just. Okay, so now I've said uh, uh, something really uh, outrageous. Uh, now, um, uh, I think that inferentialism is not committed to Hegelian. Uh, it is committed uh, to rejecting um, what Brandon calls methodologically monistic scientism and thereby uh, to rejecting both metaphilosophical and epistemological naturalism. Um, on, uh, so uh, on uh, the epistemological side, um, the kind of cognitive capacities that allow humans to participate in normative discursive practices are genuine, 
contra-eliminativism, and they cannot be reduced to a body of scientific theories, contra-reductionism. You cannot uh, reduce the competence with and understanding of semantic rules, for example, to um, a theory of natural science. Um, uh, turning to metaphilosophy, by the same token, the inferentialist's elucidation of the rules guiding these practices is not uh, an empirical theory, it's neither empirical anthropology nor uh, empirical linguistics. It, it's, instead, it takes the form of explicating rules, yeah? or as, as, a, you know, as, as Ludwig would have said, remind us uh, of uh, the rules we, we have followed all along. Um, so uh, there are the, the this uh, you know throws up two areas of conflict, and I think uh, the final area, um, uh, you know, namely inferentialists' pronounced emphasis on reasons and rationality, are at any rate in tension with uh, naturalistically inspired anthropologies. Okay, so now. Um, I turn to the first area of conflict, namely uh, normativism. Again, perhaps this is just uh, too pedestrian, but just as a reminder, I mean, I hope we can discuss details of the paper, but I, I wouldn't be able to go through this uh, fruitfully you know, on slides at the moment. Norms are, uh, have always been regarded as a threat to naturalism. I mean, ever since the old uh, uh, physis nomos contrast in, in, in antiquity, um, norms prescribe rather than describe or causally explain, and there seems to be an unbridgeable gap between is and ought. Now, one point that is important to me and that I think is at any rate underappreciated in, in, in much metanormative debate is that this alleged gap between the realm of the normative and the realm of the natural has two more specific aspects. One is um, you know, the well-known um, accusation or suspicion of a naturalistic fallacy. An attempt, any attempt to derive normative statements from statements of fact alone amounts to a fallacy. Um, and the other uh, aspect, whereas natural facts and statements seem readily comprehensible, sui generis normative facts and prescriptions seem to transcend the natural order and to defy accommodation by science. They seem. Um, I will argue that you know we, we can uh, certainly um, alleviate the sense of mystery. But I mean, for many people who are not sympathetic to naturalism, they are driven to statements which really you know are hard to um, comprehend. I remember the first time I encountered this was many many years ago in Oxford when Ralph Walker uh, in in a paper he gave to the Oxford. Uh, if a student philosophy society says, the categorical imperative is out there, right? I have no idea where it is, frankly. Um, but, you know, so that's the sort of thing that some people are driven to, uh, to claim. And, of course, if that's your perspective on normativity, then it really starts to look rather mystifying. Okay. Uh, oops. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is the wrong numbering. This is not my solution to A because I have no solution to A. I only have hand waving. But my solution for B, uh, apologies, um, is to uh, um, develop a minimalist notion of a norm, right, which is very undemanding, uh, but which can, if one differentiates it, I think uh, explain at least many of the phenomena uh, of normativity, and which implies that normative statements are innocuously truth out. Okay, so um, this is, you know, if you wish, my uh, selling point, a minimalist notion of a norm. I think this is very much in line uh, with the, the established use of the term norm. A norm is simply a general standard against which something, it could be whatever, uh, objects, events, uh, actions, beliefs can be assessed. You know, it's, 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 it's a standard for classifying something. Um, 
And uh, this minimal normative uh, normativity of a standard against which something can be assessed, with which something can be compared, can then take on various forms depending on the objects and parameters of assessment. Um, now, it is important that this is a minimalist notion of a norm and uh, that one that this minimalist notion of a norm engenders um, a more substantive yet distinct types of normativity according, you know, depending on what objects and what parameters of assessment are in play. And this is the second, uh, uh, you know, uh, rabbit I'm, I'm trying to um, deliver from my... Uh, a bowler hat, uh, namely that once we look at normativity from this perspective, uh, we get the following the types of normativity. There's classificatory or constitutive normativity, there's evaluative or axiological normativity, and finally there's deontic normativity. So in the first type of normativity, an entity is assessed as being or not being of a certain kind. Um, and X qualifies as being of kind K because it satisfies the constitutive conditions for being K. Um, there, you know, there's just one thing rather than another. Uh, uh, a mug rather than a thermos flask or a mug rather than a non-mug. Um, so that's minimal, but it, it, it means that um, something falls on one side of a standard rather than another. And now, if uh, the kind, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, according to which we classify things, carries a certain value rather than being neutral, then uh, X is assessed as being positive or negative, you know, good or bad, useful or detrimental. Um, rational or irrational. Um, and uh, the next point then is um, deontic normativity. This arises when meeting the standard is subject to obligations, roughly prescriptions or prohibitions. These are pro tanto uh, most, most of the time. So, you know, they, um, uh, they you know, uh, they are not all things, they need not be all things considered obligations, but, you know, they, they are, uh, they count in favor of doing something. Um, and uh, what is important for deontic uh, normativity, something which, uh, you know, for instance, the Stockholm um, anti-normativists don't seem to understand is that violations of prescriptions and prohibitions licenses correction in the direction of the standard. And, you know, um, finally, um, uh, a violation may be subject to sanctions uh, in a very loose sense of the term. I mean, it could just be a raised eyebrow, or, uh, but certainly um, if, you, if you do something which is incorrect, uh, that, you know, to that extent um, is, uh, licenses correction and may be subject to sanctions. Okay, lessons for, normal, for naturalism. Norms are general standards of assessment. Uh, by the same token, normative sta statements concern such standards. Um, they either state norms which are operative, which are in force in a certain um, area. And, and you know, this is the, the point of my a chess example, right? The chess king moves one square at a time, states a norm which is operative in a certain area. It states that norm from the perspective of a um, uh, uh, participant. Or an, a normative statement can also, of course, be a statement that, uh, to the effect that certain act, uh, action satisfies a standard which is operative in a certain area. And to which the speaker herself is committed. And this is a point on which I, uh, I hope to see um, eye to eye with Yanda, right? Um, uh, norms are perfectly truth apt, but um, you know, uh, they have their normative force when they are um, enunciated by someone who is a participant of or committed to a certain practice. Uh, 
So, you know, they not innocuously truth apt for the fact that uh, norms are innocuously truth apt see statements of constitutive norms in games. The chess king moves one square at a time. Um, uh, that's both truth apt and a norm. Um, so their semantic content and status is perfectly intelligible. Um, what, is, what is much uh, more difficult is well, how do we justify the norms we have? Yeah, but that, if you wish, I mean, to my mind, you know, I, I'm I'm a compartmentalizing fellow. You know, as a philosopher of mind and language, my job is done. Right? Let the uh, political theorists or moral philosophers or who have you decide, or conceptual uh, engineers decide what uh, the standards should be. What is important for me is that um, these standards are not semantically uh, mysterious. Okay. Um, now, now this is um, I'm already uh, uh, at the end uh, simply because I haven't been able to to produce more. Um, so rationalism. So you know I'm totally in agreement with inferentialism on the normative. Um, central normative dimension of um, linguistic practices of practices in which expressions have a genuine meaning um, and I'm in total agreement that these practices are um, de facto the you know, uh, prerogative of human beings um, but I do think inferentialism nevertheless over intellectualizes or runs a danger of over intellectualizing normative practices um, the first point here um, is, I think, I mean, it, it is, it's especially Brandon that I think uh, 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 faces this challenge. Um, if you take Brandon at face value, who tells you, well, we can reduce or derive intentionality from normativity, I think that can't be right because any genuine normativity, any practice of following rules, either explicit or implicit rules, it doesn't matter, involves acting for reasons. And if acting for reasons were tied to language uh, or to rules, an explanatory circle would loom. So intentionality is, is, is more basic than normativity in that in order for normative practices to arise, you must be able to act for a reason. And to act for a reason is, you know, acting in, uh, in the view of facts or presumed facts, and that's a perfectly good, good and and respectable notion of intentionality. So you know, I'm not saying that this is an, a knockdown argument, but you know, I, I think um, much more attention would have to be paid to this um, uh, to this uh, point. I mean, you know, I, I in the paper I discussed two. Uh, to uh, reasons that I could detect in Brandom for, for reversing the order of priority, but I have found both of them wanting. And um, the second point, um, the giving and asking for reasons may be distinctive of human languages, but it is not a prerequisite of language per se. Um, you know, I think um, that's simply a stipulation. Uh, Wittgenstein's builders, you know, uh, engage in a bona fide language. Um, and uh, not only is uh, the giving and asking for reasons not a necessary precondition of language per se, um, it, it, it can't possibly be the root of language. Um, I think, you know, there, there are uh, uh, absolutely overwhelming evolutionary reasons against supposing that this is the case. I mean, the comparative method suggests that our common ancestor, the last common ancestor with the great apes, was not into um, informational or uh, declarative communication, um, and that the whole thing arose out of the need to synchronize um, joint action. Okay, right. Um, so what I haven't done is, you know, my plea for anthropological naturalism. Um, I do think that and, and this this uh, arises, I hope, more or less naturally out of what I said about rat uh, rationalism. Um, so, uh, 
giving and acting for reasons is something distinctive about human beings, but it is distinctive about human beings because of our biological nature. Yeah, and, and this is a, and it is something which is, a, if you wish, a refinement. It's a refinement of um, less intellectual practices. So, um, and this is a point about human nature. And I think uh, a naturalism of human nature is a perfectly respectable uh, form of naturalism. I argue that in the paper against Gerd Keil. Um, and, you know, Peter Strawson is my, is my example here. So it is part of our nature, part of our real character to be part of nature. And it's part of our uh, nature, of our real character, that we are a very distinctive part we are not just intelligent and social. I mean, other primates are that uh, just as much. Well, uh, I mean, other primates are in the same uh, uh, league as we are in, in those respects, but we are also cooperative. We have possessed language. We are subject to norms and we are um, capable of progressive cultural development. So, uh, We cannot escape the normative perspective which that imposes, but that is due to the type of animal we are. And, um, you know, I, I, well, perhaps at the risk of, of uh, appealing to authority, um, you know, I quote in the paper two um, pertinent um, passages from Wittgenstein. I mean, I don't deal, uh, treat Wittgenstein as a definitive authority, believe you me. But anyway, um, uh, Wittgenstein, I think, uh, says rightly, um, commanding, questioning, recounting, chatting are as much part of our natural history as walking, eating, drinking, playing. These are very natural phenomena. Um, so that much, I think, uh, most inferentialists could agree. Uh, I think they would uh, have more they would feel more skittish about the following. The origin and the primitive form of the language game is a reaction. Only from this can more complicated forms develop. Language, I want to say, is refinement. In the beginning was the deed. Uh, a quote from Goethe's Faust. And uh, so, uh, uh, a passage which I find even more um, it epitomizes my, my take on anthropological naturalism as it applies to language even more is uh, from Herder, um, who, you know, I mean, who, who is really underappreciated. Um, Herder gave a revolutionary response to the then prevailing dogma that, you know, while you could explain just about anything else about human beings in a kind of scientific way. Language must have divine origins. Uh, and he says, already as an animal, you man, der Mensch, possesses language. You know, language is just as natural to our form of life as, you know, uh, um, commanding, I'm oh, sorry, as walking, eating, drinking, playing. And um, I thank you for your patience and apologize for uh, uh, not having produced a more polished, uh, uh, more polished slide. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. We have 40 minutes for discussion. Uh, Professor Glock focused more on the first part of his paper, but for those who read the paper, uh, you can ask basically about any part. That's right. Okay. So anyone who has a question, please use the raise your hand button. Preston, you can start. Thank you. Uh, hi, Professor Glock. I wanted to ask about something that seemed to be more central in the paper, but maybe came up here as well. It's this claim about classification as being mm -hmm. some sort of foundation, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, of, yes. of or rational capacities in a way that you're concerned maybe inferentialism doesn't leave room for. Mm -hmm. I just I just wondered what you meant by that. So in some places it seemed like you were thinking of classification as perceptual responsiveness. So you give the example of this is red as being something that 
maybe inferentialism is committed to thinking is an inference where it seems like that sort mm -hmm. of an, an odd way of thinking about perception. But then in other cases, it seems like classification is spelled out in terms of being able to classify something as a member of a kind. So in the talk, you, you gave the three ways of thinking about normativity. And the first one was this classificatory or constitutive way. And, and I just wondered if, if those were two different uses of classificatory or if you thought that they were connected in some way because perceptual responding, perceptually responding to things is red. Red's not a kind term, so it doesn't involve classification in that other sense. Um, and, and also you might think that classification in terms of a kind need not be founded on perception. So maybe natural number is something that involves classificatory capacities. Mm -hmm. And so what's the, what's your account of, of the foundation there? Is it perceptual? And if so, is it not classificatory in terms of kind classification? Or, or is cl kind classification supposed to be the foundation? In which case, what's the relation to perception? Okay. Um, now, just as a, as a matter of, of clarification, um, the, the trichotomy, uh, classificatory, constitutive, uh, evaluative, axiological, and deontic, those are not supposed to be diff different takes on normativity. Those are uh, different forms that normativity can can take. Okay. Um, but um, <clears throat> and uh, indeed, uh, the classificatory constitutive um, uh, kind of normativity is also supposed to be the one that um, I uh, invoke as a as a challenge uh, to inferentialism. So you know. Um, when I talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, when I complain that uh, uh, inferentialism uh, sort of puts the car before the horse, I mean, to put it very bluntly, by thinking that classification de derives from um, inference, then, you know, that is meant to be classification in the sense of, you know, uh, classifying something as being of a certain kind. Now, your, your interesting question is, um, uh, in what sense is that foundational? Well, I think in a conceptual sense, it's foundational um, along the ways in which I you know, indicated that you, you can derive the more recognized forms of, of normativity, namely evaluation and, uh, if you wish, obligation, um, uh, out of it, I, at least I've tried to, to, to do that in the pa paper, but in, in terms of uh, the um, onto and phylogenesis, uh, uh, you're quite right. Um, I guess my line is that it all starts out with perception. Now, I'm not sure that this is red. I mean, is red a kind term? It's certainly, red is not a sort of, right? It's not uh, the kind of general term which uh, provides you with principles of individuation. I mean, you know, I, 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 you know, they are uh, principles of individuation uh, and criteria of identity. So, you know, I mean, you know, contrast IT device. You know, they're, they're, I mean, the 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 notion of IT device is a is a sort also. You know, there are clear principles for how to say that there are three IT devices currently in this room. This one, this one, this one. But there's no way of specifying how many red things here are, right? So to that extent, uh, I think you're right. I still think that um, red uh, is subject to a, to a, a standard. Um, and so, you know, I think I would still say that red um, satisfies this uh, bottom tier um, classificator, uh, classificatory um, uh, type of of um, of normativity, but only um, if it goes beyond mere discrimination. So I, I guess that I you know I would agree with the view that I I detect in your in your um, contribution, namely um, that not every uh, creature that's capable of discriminating is capable of classifying, right? Um, now, um, I acknowledge in the paper that one way of um, explaining the difference is by saying, well, a, a creature, I mean, let's say a, a butterfly, Davidson's famous butterfly, um, 
uh, that prefers red to green, you know, it isn't classifying, it's discriminating. Uh, why? Because it can't draw any inferential uh, uh, con uh, consequences. But, you know, I, um, I have in, in two or three of my articles tried to show that there is a less demanding and less presumptuous way of doing this, namely um, a, a discrimination turns into classification if it is deliberate and controlled. Um, so, you know, you can deliberately take note of a, of a distinction in one of, you can deliberately take note of a difference in one context, disregarded in another, and the, uh, the discrimination is subject to correction. Um, now, whether that works or not, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to put, put the references in the chat, but, you know, that would be my, my, um, my alternative. But, you know, I've, I've, you know I, I think you're absolutely right that um, one needs to elaborate on uh, how classification in the sense of the, the bottom tier of, of normativity that I distinguish is related to mere perception. Fair. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Dago. Uh, okay. Hi, Hi Adam. Hi, Neil. Hi. Uh, so there are a lot of things in, in what you say, which I would uh, happily subscribe to. There are a few things which are either don't understand or I find problematic. So, mm -hmm. so let me ask uh, first thing, the uh, metaphilosophical naturalism. Mm -hmm. You say that it's, it says that uh, philosophy is either continuous with or part of science. So it seems to me that the, these are two different things. I would not like to say, say that philosophy is part of science or mm -hmm. a scientific discipline. But on the other hand, I would like to say that it's continuous with science in the sense that between philosophical questions and answers and scientific questions and answers, there is a boundary which is quite blurry, mm -hmm. which is uh, not, not sharp. Mm -hmm. And you say, you say uh, if I interpret correctly the, the passage, which is in your paper on page six, that inferentialism and uh, uh, use theory more generally repudiate, repudiates this methodological, methodological, uh, oh, metaphysical, metaphilosophical naturalism, mm -hmm. because um, to to participate in normative discursive practices must be genuine. Uh, the the understanding that allows humans to participate in normative discursive practices must be genuine, contra eliminativism and mm -hmm. so on. I don't understand what this amounts to. What what the genuine un, uh, uh, understanding means? Uh, okay. Do you do you want to say that if I learn all the rules which, according to me as an inferentialist, determines the meaning of an expression, I will still not understand it, or? Uh, I, I'm not sure okay. I understand. Okay, okay, okay. Now, I mean, uh, uh, on the point of part of a continuous with science, um, you're quite right, these are slightly different um, ideals, or can be slightly different ideals. I guess that uh, that formulation is a hangover from my book on on Quine and Davidson, where, okay. you know, uh, Quine uh, characterizes, uh, you know, uh, the relationship of, of philosophy to science as being either part of or, um, uh, or continuous with. I mean, I do absolutely agree that there are borderline cases, and I should have acknowledged that. Um, in fact, um, now that you mention it, um, uh, that, you know, I, I, a more careful uh, phrasing would be more in line with um, with what I uh, what I say uh, on pages twenty one to twenty two, where I recommend um, in the spirit of I think uh, Wittgenstein and Tomasello um, the uh, neglected tradition of natural history. Yeah, you know? um, uh, 
So, and that is a kind of anthropology, which is on the one hand, you know, it certainly should be biologically informed. Um, uh, it should also, you know, be informed by an understanding of, of our social life and um, um, uh, by an understanding of certain truisms, which, you know, what, are they scientific or not? So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 so that's a point well taken. Um, so I, 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 better, I better revisit that. Um, the, but the second point was uh, on... Um, Genuine understanding. Yes, 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 yes. Now, yes, what I, this is the bottom of page six. Um, yes, yes. Um, so now, you know, I, I guess we all agreed that there are these normative practices which are, you know, constitutive not just of meaning, but also of human rationality and much other. I mean, they are, you know, I mean, there's always also an effective emotional side to me, which we, I mean, both the infantilists and, and I have relatively little to say about. But uh, anyway, um, so now there is a kind of competency and, 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 and an understanding. And when I say that uh, this understanding must be genuine, then I think I should have said it, this constitutes a genuine kind of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not subject to an eliminativist, uh, you know, an epistemological naturalist who is an eliminativist and says, well, look, you know, yeah, yes, she, you, you, you tell me about the understanding that's afforded by reading literature or appreciating a piece of music. Um, well, you know, that is not knowledge at all. You tell me that there's a kind of linguistic competence, uh, you know, very, very cardboard characterization um, and knowing how, which is, which is uh, not is sort of um, reducible to a list of propositions. In that case, it isn't knowledge. So, you know, that's what I had in mind. So, so the eliminativist would say that um, uh, the things that may be uh, uh, distinctive about normative discursive practices, um, you know, they don't qualify as knowledge. Right. Whereas I would say, well, you know, I do know how to use the term, the English term ambidextrous. I do know how to speak English. I don't know how to speak Czech, etc. cetera. Yeah. And that this is a kind of knowledge. And uh, yeah, so that's what I had in mind here. And then I think with the, the, the next sentence, which you didn't uh, read out, but I then say, by the same token, the inferentialist elucidation of the rules guiding these practices is not an empirical anthropological or linguistic theory. It, um, instead, it takes the form of explicating these rules, rules which the inferentialist herself follows. So there, you know, I'm, I, I hope to be making a point which I also found in, 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 in your book on inferentialism, namely that um, when we talk about explicating, uh, and I think this is a very good term, um, uh, explicating the rules we follow, um, we don't do that from uh, the perspective of the, of the uh, unengaged observer. We uh, do that from the perspective of someone who participates in the practice. I mean, it's a bit like, mm. you know, I can, I can explicate the rules of a Scottish um, barn dance, right? Uh, uh, because I do it. I sometimes do it. Yeah. Um, and that's what I had in mind here. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, I would have more questions, but I, I let other people ask and if then sometime, so I may. Oh, Go certainly. Ahead. I mean, we can also, you know, can also, you know, I mean, I, I realize uh, the fact that you agree with most of it is, is, is most gratifying, but the fact that you disagree <laughs> yeah. with some of it is not exactly a drawback either, because, you know, that's, uh, that's how, how philosophy uh, happens, yes. Yes. Thank you, Yarda. We can continue with Indrek, and if there's going to be time, then you can ask again. Okay, Indrek, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, so like Kiara, I am very sympathetic to most of it. I just have some minor quibbles here and there. So, so he, here's, here's one minor quibble. It's about the part where you uh, demystify rules. And sort of you arrive at the view that they're truth out. And I'm wondering whether we 
couldn't hold on to the strong intuition that we don't call rules and norms true, mm -hmm. but just simply drawing more distinctions. Mm -hmm. So you might think whenever there's a rule that's in force, mm -hmm. there's also a corresponding uh, normative fact. Mm -hmm. So for example, when there's a law that's in force, there's also a legal fact generated by the law. Mm -hmm. So when we report the legal fact, um, it might have the same content as the rule, the same propositional content. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the report of the legal fact is truth out. Mm -hmm. But we might still think the rule itself, even though it has the right sort of content, is not truth out. Mm -hmm. um, because you might think, for example, that uh, rules are basically performative. Mm -hmm or acceptance is a sort of non-truth of value latitude. So roughly like certain uncertain interpretations of Hart's internal point of view, you get a sort mm -hmm. of expressive or quasi-expressive reading. And so, I mean, none of this changes in any way, any of your conclusions or anything, but, but we, can, we can draw a finer distinction between rules and the corresponding reports of the facts they generate and thereby, um, you know, sort of preserve the intuition that rules are not, rules themselves are not true or false. Mm -hmm. um, right. The corresponding uh, rule generated normally facts that are. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, I'm absolutely in agreement with you that uh, a final taxonomy um, is always uh, in place. Um, I did say that um, what, what I said about um, the uh, defanging the conflict or, or, or um, alleviating the conflict with naturalism is, um, is a, a matter of what I say about normative statements, right, or norms. Now, um, rules, well, you know, this is, this is, uh, uh, I, as I say, I hope I say it here, but I've said it elsewhere. Um, in philosophy, you don't have a well-established, uh, you don't have a clear and um, widely accepted distinction between norms and rules. Not that I know of. Um, one possibility is to think that rules pertain specifically to actions and rules um, are uh, more often than not, not of the constitutive kind, but of the regulative kind. Yeah, um, and to that extent, they would be wedded to what I would call deontic normativity. The, 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 these are not. I mean, you know, I am. I, I like to think of myself as uh, as a as a conceptual analyst, but this is not something which I say is clearly the the case in in linguistic practice. But it's a kind of refinement. Now, still, how many rules? Uh, are imperative. I mean, you know, uh, there is a rule not to or don't step on the lawn. You know, I would agree. You know, I mean, I, these are certainly not truth apt, but um, the normative statement, it is forbidden to step on the lawn. I mean, the statement is forbidden to, st to step on the lawn or um, uh, it is permitted uh, to smoke in the designated areas. Um, these statements can, and th that's where I would uh, include, uh, you know, introduce a, a distinction. These statements can either be what von Ritt called norm propositions, uh, namely an empirical proposition that a community by and large and with all the sort of Herbert Hart kind of qualifications follows the norm, or it can be the expression of a, of a norm. And so I'm perfectly uh, happy to say that for deontic norms, not for constitutive norms, but for deontic norms, um, there are always non-truth apt um, equivalents. And I would also be, and I, and, and I think I'm grateful for the suggestion, I think that would be in line with my, with my idea that um, uh, at the bottom of the language game, there may not be these declarative truth apt statements, but something more imperative or something like that. Um, but I would I would like to insist that there's um, that 
there is a difference between my saying the king moves one square at a time yeah when you're trying to get out of checkmate by you know jumping over a, a pawn in front of your king right and uh, someone an, an alien and you know an, an extraterrestrial um, um, uh, anthropologist you know uh, starting to understand the you know the the, the um, uh, game of chess so you know I, I would say that it's not so much a matter of linguistic form but a function but yeah I, I think you are quite right I should say something about the uh, uh, connection between uh, non-indicatively phrased rules and uh, corresponding normative statements. So just to clarify for a moment, so I wasn't thinking that rules have imperatival content. Or, okay. Uh, you know, I wasn't, I was leaving that on one side. That's a possible view, but it's not a view I particularly like. Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of like a rule and a corresponding report of a normative fact that's rule generated could share mm -hmm. their content. So they both would have exactly the same proposition of content. Mm -hmm. The difference comes in in function. So mm -hmm. roughly, you know, when a lawmaker makes a law, you know, maybe, I don't know, sets a curfew that like you, you must stay in after six o'clock, that's, you might think that has a performative function it generates a new legal fact okay. but that the the rule that statement is not even though it has propositional content it's not like the enactment as an act is not truth valuable that's just laying okay. down the law oh, oh, okay the yes sport of the law mm -hmm. like next day in the newspaper yes. is truth valuable okay yeah um, that's and that's yeah. not really then a a, a rule that's like a report of the new legal fact. So I was, I was setting imperatives on one side. So even sticking with the with the declarative form, there's yeah. still a distinction to be drawn between the rule and the uh, yeah. rule general legal fact. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I hope uh, to at least um, have the conceptual wherewithal to uh, acknowledge this uh, in you know in because I think that it's quite clear that one and the same utterance, and I'm just talking about now an utterance on a particular occasion, can have more than one function. It can be both declarative and non-declarative, right? Um, uh, I mean, you know, if I tell you there's a bull in the field, right, that can be a warning, uh, can be an encouragement because I know that you're the uh, f uh, famous uh, matador from Barcelona or whatnot, right? Um, but it can have these various functions in addition. Um, and so I guess, uh, so I hope that I have the wherewithal and it's absolutely clear and this is one of the uh, true insights of uh, of inferentialism, uh, but I think also of an insight of people like von Savigny and Alston that speech acts, which are declarative, can alter by way of a performative ripple, uh, you know, uh, 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 situations in, in 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 ways that go beyond, uh, you know, uh, just passing on information. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I think these are very good things to to elaborate on. Yeah. Philip, you can continue. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. So, Hans, I, I would like to ask you, do you think that you can really make anthropological naturalism which is not reductive? Because this was your point that uh, like you are for naturalism but not for reductionism. Mm -hmm. So, as, as I understand it, like you, you would, you. Uh, you didn't have time like to go into details with yeah. anthropological naturalism, but as I understand it, your strategy would be to pinpoint some uh, specific characteristics of humans like normativity, rationality, mm -hmm. productive right. culture development. Yes. So they are, in, in my eyes, there are afterwards two options. The first one would be uh, truly nat naturalistic one, like this would be a starting point for what we mean by further cultural developments. Mm -hmm. But in, in that case, there are some phenomena 
for example, that uh, we uh, only humans have something which could be called history, mm -hmm. that we are also already embedded. Some of our capacities uh, are not only biological, but somehow also connected to cultural development. Mm -hmm. So uh, once you agree with this, you are on the side which I would call truly anthropological. <laughs> but if you do not agree with this, in my point of view, you are on the reductionist side. So you, you reduce further cultural developments to, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, language of natural science. So how would you avoid this? Okay, that's, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think it, it uh, goes in uh, a direction similar to that of, of Yadav's question. I mean, continuous with, you know, what, what we do in explicating uh, rules of normative practices, you know, where's the line to science, where's the line between social science and biological science? I do think that there are features of human beings that defy explanation, that, 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 yeah, that defy understanding, and the causal origins can be explained through hard science. I mean, you know, if in, to the extent to which um, um, evolutionary theory and information theory are hard sciences, the, the causal origins can be explained in terms of hard sciences, but what they amount to cannot be explained in terms of hard sciences. And um, I would say that uh, being cultural, being linguistic, being cooperative, being normative um, is part of our animal, of the nature of the animals we are, um, and to that extent, reductionism is just. If that's reductionist, then I am a reductionist. But if it if it is to say that in order to understand what's going on, um, well, look, I mean, you have. <laughs> in order to understand what's currently going on, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in Europe, uh, you know. The, the, we need to rely on forms of historical and cultural understanding, which are just categorically removed to anything that happens in, in natural science. Now, I hope that's consistent. Um, I mean, um, uh, but I, I realize that this is a bit of bit of hand waving. But but let me just put uh, put one thing to you. Um, I do think that um, we can understand how evol uh, biological evolution resulted in creatures that um, are capable of um, engaging in cultural activities and linguistic activities, uh, activities which are then subject to cultural and linguistic evolution. Those are not the same, but you know, closely related. And um, that's what I, you know, that's what I would say store by. And that, to that extent, I am, I am a, a reductionist. I like to, to make complex things simple. So instead of simply saying, oh, look, you know, humans are so different. Look, um, uh, the social and historical sciences operate in such a different way. Um, you know, there's, there's a complete chasm between them. I'm more in, in, in favor of understanding how um laws or, or regularities of a very special kind um could come about given um that there are you know, that there are already in place um, uh, laws or regularities of a more primitive kind so yeah i mean i'm just trying to steer a, a middle course and as many people have told me you know it's it, this is like walking along a precipice and you're bound to you know drop drop down on either side but yeah i can't help trying to do it but anyway i mean i you know i think i i, I must be much more specific about what you know what the kind of natural history i i i uh I, I uh, propagate here briefly is supposed to be. 
Awesome. Here we go. Hi, Hanil. Hi. So let me return to to the issue which you had raised. So you say that inferentialists aim to explicate inferential rules that they follow themselves as they take part in linguistic practices. Mm -hmm. And this you submit is not a kind of anthropological or linguistic research or theory or understanding. Mm -hmm. Indeed, you seem to imply that inferentialism is therefore, or in part because of this, incompatible with methodological naturalism because the method of explication is kind of unique. Mm -hmm. And also the kind of understanding resulting is kind of unique. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that inferentialism, at least of Yarda's caliber, maybe not of Brandon's caliber, uh, explicitly say that they aim to substantiate mostly kind of meta-semantic theory of meaning in terms of inferential rules. So, and they of course give a kind of couple of instructive examples, such as logical expression, which seems to be particularly suitable to this kind of treatment. At the same time, however, they allow that it is mostly a matter of empirical research to discover which inferential rules actually determine meanings of expression in this or that linguistic community. Mm -hmm. Yarda at least implies that this is quite consistent with the kind of methodological naturalism. Indeed, David Mate considered to have a research on what kind of inferential rules determine the meanings of expression in a natural language like Czech language. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what's your, what's your position on this issue? So it seems to me that there are two kind of uh, two kinds of projects. One is the kind of meta-semantic project, which argues, well, that representational approaches to meaning are wrong. Mm -hmm. We have something better, perhaps, which is kind of inferentialism, and we can give a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. But then they mostly say, but it's not up to us to say what particular mm -hmm. inferential rules govern the meanings of expression, say, in Czech language. That's mm -hmm. kind of linguistic, anthropological, empirical research. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I accept this. Uh, um, you know, uh, I'm not terribly fond of this semantic, metasemantic uh, distinction, but um, I, I think that uh, what uh, occurs from the armchair, oh, now I'm using that term, um, is an understanding of, for instance, uh, what it is that distinguishes for me a meaningful e expression as uttered by a, a speaker of Czech or Swahili or whatnot uh, from, I don't know what, uh, either uh, the uh, uh, noise of a lawnmower or uh, the uh, um, uh, vocalizations of a bird. Um, so that to that extent, I think it's... Um, it's an articulation of what we mean by meaning, what we mean by understanding, what we mean by uh, uh, communicating. Um, and that, I think, is the sort of pre-theoretical basis on which then inferentialism erects a theoretical edifice. And, you know, I think that's admirable. And that's certainly not something which one can do simply by sitting in the armchair, but it's not something you do by, you know, going out with a microphone, you know, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the center uh, of, of uh, Pilsen, for instance, right? So um, uh, the, what, what the rules are in a particular language, I think that's an empirical, that's an empirical question. So, I mean, I think, you know, here, I, I find uh, Davidson quite useful. You know, he, he said, well, he wanted to um, uh, bypass questions like what is meaning by looking at how we would establish the meaning of, uh, uh, of an entirely unknown language. But of course, you know, thinking about how we would establish the meaning of an entirely unknown language in Davidson, as in, you know, all the, you know, most philosophers of language I think of was not an empirical enterprise. So, you know, that, that would be my, my line. Um, and I mean, I come back to something which I said already in response to Yada. Um, I do think that um, what we explicate in what I would call conceptual analysis is participatory knowledge. You know, we, we participate in the linguistic practice willy-nilly, 
right? Um, and we participate highly complex uh, rules and structures um, of a practice we participate in. And that's, you know, certainly not in well, the very opposite of infallible. It's um, complex. It requires uh, more than sitting in the armchair, but it is not empirical in the sense of collecting empirical data. Although, you know, I wouldn't, if, you know, I have many colleagues in experimental philosophy here in this very building, you know, I wouldn't, uh, you know, reject their findings and say, oh, that's, you know, that's empirical. I mean, I think they're very of, uh, often good, good, good uh, indicators, but, um, I would still subject what they tell me about how people talk about voluntary versus involuntary against how I think uh, I'm using the term and how I think people around me are using it. So, but in principle, I agree with you. There is, a, um, call it a priori, not infallible. There's a, a priori reflection on the uh, certain concepts shared across different languages. And there is the empirical task of establishing what uh, the, the specific linguistic rules are in, a, in, a, in another community. Interesting point is, you know, what happens if instead of, you know, learning Czech, um, you know, through a textbook, right, um, I learn Czech by simply being immersed. Um, then I think, I guess, that would be just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, bypassing the theoretical perspective and just put, you know, learning by doing. And that, I think that may be a special case again. Thank you, Anit. That was very thank, helpful. Thank, thank you for the question. Antonio? Sorry. Oh. Thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. It was great. The paper was very useful to think about an awful lot of things, also in cognitive science, and I, I think I agree with most of it, and especially with the spirit of it. So, so I have mostly questions of detail. Mm -hmm. So very, very minor things. So, so, and I have plenty, but I know we are running out of time. So, so just one. Uh, when you talk about uh, combining the two operators, it is a rule that, uh -huh. and it is true that. Yeah. And you say, so although statements like it is, a tr it is a rule that P or it is true that P are perfectly compatible, what, what we uh, seemingly are not allowed to do is to combine them. So, so and what you mean, I guess, is like embedding them. So, so uh, it's infelicitous to embed them, uh, for instance, by saying uh, it is a rule that it is true that the king, the chess king, can move only by one square or whatever. Uh huh. So, and I thought, and, and you say there's uh, the incompatibility in the embedding. I mean, I mean, the infelicity of the embedding is because uh, the two operators have different functions. Mm -hmm. So one is to state the normative status or something, and the other one is to state the uh, the fact that a rule holds in some context or other. Mm -hmm. And I thought one way of showing this is would be to say that the opposite embedding is perfectly felicitous. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I could say it is true that it is a rule mm -hmm. that yeah. the chess king can move only and so on and so forth. Yes. Yeah. But but it is also on the other hand, it's not. It, it appears to me that it is a rule that it is true. The chess king and so on is is plainly false because that it is not a rule of chess. Yeah. So if we say the rule of chess, I mean it is a rule of chess that it is true that the king and so on. But what we're stating is something strictly speaking false mm -hmm. because it, that's not the rule of chess. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I mean, uh, in fact, you suggested two other embedding, um, two embeddings, which were not um, the ones I discuss in the in the paper, but you know, are, are just as intriguing. I mean, I I discuss so you know on page sixteen at the bottom. So, um, I say it is true that that the chess king moves one square at a time is perfectly compatible with it is a rule that the chess king moves one square at a time. 
uh, what I said is in felicities is the rule that P is, is true, right? Um, and you now are bringing to other uh, locutions, it is a rule that it is true that the chess king moves one square at a time. And you quite rightly say, well, I mean, I, I'm not even sure that is, I'm not even sure that is grammatical. Um, you know, I'm not a native speaker, but uh, I, I think I have some competence in English. It is a rule that it is true that P, I mean, if you say as a rule, it is true that P, uh, you know, as a matter of, 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 uh, of, of probability, it is the case that P, that would be um, uh, uh, grammatical, but not it is a rule that it is true that P. Um, so that's ungrammatical, but you're absolutely right. Another embedding, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm duly taking note of all the uh, uh, cases. It is true that it is a rule that P, that is obviously uh, grammatical. Now, normally, I think we would say that um, it is true that it is a rule that P, when we make uh, the kind of... Um, norm proposition which i alluded to right you know i i say oh yes it, it, it is true that um it, it is now a rule that uh, the uh, the the pawns can move uh, two squares in their first move but in the middle ages it was not true right um and so you know that i think we tend to associate this embedding as uh, as you said with the with the uh, taking a perspective on the practice, right? We say that, um, as a matter of fact, a, a certain rule pertains. Um, it's it's uh, less. Um, uh, it it would I think be less common when we when we make a, a statement from the perspective of of a participant. I mean, you know, if if you you know, for instance, if I try to get out of chess by by uh, by moving my king two squares at a time, um, and you say, well, the chess king moves one square at a time, right? Um, then um, I, you know, I, I, I could say, um, you know, uh, you're right. Um, but I wouldn't say it is true that is a, that it is a rule that the chess king moves one square at a time, because that would suggest that, you know, I'm not bound by this rule. Um, anyway, I mean, you know, I, I, I do think that this is an additional embedding. It is an embedding which is standardly used, in my view, um, not to um, express a rule from the, uh, reinforce a, a rule from the perspective of, of a participant, but to just note what rules, you know, others are following. We have run out of time, but if Professor Block agrees and Yarda has some questions, then we can continue for a few minutes. Okay. Just, yes, uh, let's let's have one more, uh, yeah, or one or two more questions from Yarda or someone else, and then you know, since I'm I'm in between two, I mean, I had my seminar before and I have another one following. Okay. So yeah. Uh, I I think I have learned a lot from the discussion. I have learned some answers to the question I myself would have. So at present, I have no really question to ask. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, I, I you know, just uh, discussing these things with you just makes me realize how, what a great group this is. And well, you know, I mean, I, I think I should participate more often in, 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 if, if you guys do certain things. I mean, if, you know, in your, in your um, activities. I mean, I, I found this most helpful. Incidentally, I simply can't help just uh, telling you from the privileged confines of, of uh, Switzerland, where Russian oligarchs are much more welcome than Ukrainian refugees that, you know, I mean, thumbs up to all of Eastern Europe, um, you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's pretty admirable the way you guys are handling these things. So, yeah. Thank you for the support. And um, it's really, I'm really sorry that we do not have an opportunity to discuss your paper over a beer after the talk. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, one beer, come on, right? Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll believe much more of this when you've had three. 
But yeah, uh, and I, I, I told this Yada many times. I'm normally I only uh, sacrifice my neurons to God Bachus, but in 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 the in tech, yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, there's no way around beer. Absolutely not. Okay. Um, yeah, really thanks a lot, and, and I'll try. You know, I'll get your I'll get your mailings for the following discussions, and I'll try time permitting. I'll try to to participate. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you for thank you very much. Again. Uh, we, thank you. The series of talk continue in two weeks. Uh, Bernard Weiss will present his paper on the evolution of rule following. So, okay, uh, I will send some invitations around. Uh, everyone is welcome. Okay. Thank See you. you. See you in two Bye. weeks. Thank you.